Good evening. We're so happy that you've joined us for our Christmas Eve service. Yeah, I know. We're not in person. We're virtual this year, but just because of a number of logistical reasons, we're not able to do Christmas Eve service in person this year, but we still wanted to have something special. We still wanted to provide you an opportunity to gather with your family to celebrate and even though we can't do it together at church, we can still do it together in spirit online. Now, um, we've included some music to go along with the message, and I'm going to take communion a little bit later. And if you've been at church the past few weeks, you've had the opportunity to get our, our disposable communion cups that have the bread and the juice. Uh, but if you haven't been at church the past few weeks, you haven't had that opportunity, but you can still take communion with us because remember, it's a, it's a symbol. So it doesn't have to be the little wafer that we give you. It could be a cracker that you have at your house. Uh, it doesn't have to be the juice, grape juice that we provide. It, it can be, um, you know, a, a Gatorade. <laughs> it could even be some tea or whatever. It's a symbol. It's a reminder. It's a reminder of Christ's body and his blood. And so I would encourage you at the outset of this service, if you haven't had the opportunity to get those disposable communion cups from us, grab something so that you can celebrate communion with us as a family together tonight in our service. We got some music that's been pre-recorded by some of our church members for you. And I'm going to share a message with you in just a little while. We're so glad that you joined us for our virtual Christmas Eve service tonight. Hey, I want to share with you a message on this Christmas Eve. You know, you're probably already getting a few questions like this. And if you haven't gotten them like this, you know, you know how the questions go. You'll have those family members, if you're able to get together with them, um, maybe you'll get it together in person, or maybe you'll be on FaceTime or on Zoom, and you'll have people say, hey, what did you get for Christmas? Or what are you hoping to get for Christmas? Or even to the kids, what's Santa Claus bringing you for Christmas? And we get those questions almost every year when Christmas comes around. What are you getting for Christmas? I've got a different question for you this Christmas. And as we celebrate this Christmas Eve, this Christmas time, um, I want to give you this thought. What are you getting from Christmas this year? Now, it's a little easier to answer what we're getting for Christmas. Oh, maybe it's a PlayStation or 
maybe it's a new car or maybe it's a pair of pliers that we wanted or I don't know. But you know, you've got a pretty good idea of some of the things that you might be getting for Christmas. But when we stop to think about what we're getting from Christmas, that question might be a little harder to answer, especially this year. What am I getting from this Christmas? What, what am I taking away from this Christmas holiday? What is it that the Lord is laying on me? What am I getting from Christmas? Well, maybe I can help you answer that question a little bit. I'm going to read two scriptures. They're usually not used around Christmas time. That's okay. I think they'll fit pretty well. The first one is from 1 John chapter 4. And it says in verse 9, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved, but that God has loved us and sent His Son to be the payment for our sins. So that's the first scripture. And then I'm going to take this scripture from Revelation, uh, from Romans chapter 15, um, verse 13. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, I want to talk to you about what you can get from Christmas this year. You know, there's some words that are often thrown around in the Christmas season, at Christmas time. Hope, and joy, and peace, and love. And in some Christian traditions, they even celebrate the Advent season and they'll have an Advent wreath with Advent candles. And did you know that those four candles on the Advent wreath, they are named hope and joy and peace and love. I want you to get some hope from this Christmas season. It's been a rough year. But you know, Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, may the God of all hope. And then at the end of that verse, it says, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's make sure we understand what hope means if you've been around Newbridge for any length of time, you've probably heard me give this definition before because I think it's critically important for us to understand the biblical meaning of hope. Now, when we use the term hope, we generally mean, I wish. I hope I'm getting a new truck for Christmas. <laughs> I hope we get to head to Cancun this next year. And what we're saying is, I wish though that wish really might not come true, and in many cases probably won't. But the word hope in Scripture doesn't mean I wish. It means I know. Hope is a certainty. Hope is a sure thing. Hey, this Christmas season, the Lord wants us to take hope from Christmas. We have a certainty. We have a certainty that Jesus Christ, Almighty God, became incarnate in the flesh, born as a child in Bethlehem. He came to be our hope. He came to be our certainty. You know, even in these uncertain times, we can get some hope from Christmas. What are you going to get from this Christmas? I'd like for you to get some hope. And I'd like for you to get some joy. Now, joy 
can easily be confused with happiness. Happiness is a feeling that comes from an external stimulus. Grandma sent me a Christmas card and it had a gift card to Sweet Frog in it. And I'm happy to take that gift card for Sweet Frog and go and enjoy some frozen yogurt with Reese cups on top of it and caramel and chocolate. Mm, yeah, that's a response to an external stimulus. It's happiness, but happiness is fleeting. Whenever the external stimuli change, my feelings of happiness may flee. Joy is different. Joy wells up from the inside. Joy is something that comes internally and flows outward, where happiness is a response to something that comes inward. Think of it this way. Uh, you know, this year has been, <laughs> ooh, it's been strange in so many ways. Um, this was the year that had the most hurricanes on record. Most named storms, I should say, on record. Had to go all the way into the Greek alphabet to name some of those storms. Boy, if you lived in Louisiana, you hate to think about the word hurricane. But did you know that when a hurricane, even the strongest hurricane, approaches land, you know, that hurricane may be hundreds of miles in distance. The diameter of that storm is incredible. But did you know that a hurricane, even at its strongest, only changes the current of the water down to about 90 meters, 300 feet? That's about how deep the currents can be affected by a major hurricane. Now to put that in perspective, it's 300 feet. The average depth of the ocean, oceans around the world, the average ocean depth, Atlantic, Pacific, Arctic, any, the average depth is two Point three miles, 12,000 feet. The deepest part of the world's oceans is found off the end of the Marianas Trench near the island of Guam. It's 36,200 feet deep. A major hurricane that would go through there would only touch 300 feet at its deepest part. You know what marine life does when a major hurricane comes through? All of those marine animals, when a major storm comes through and those currents are swirling on top, they dive down below 300 feet to where they hit the, the peaceful waters. The joy that we have in the Lord is something that wells up from the inside. And even though all these things that are happening around us may cause us to lose our happiness for a moment, I have joy because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And it's deep inside my heart and my soul what do you get from Christmas this year? Well, I hope that you get some hope. I hope that you get some joy. Joy that isn't affected by external things, but is caused by something that's happened on the inside. Which leads me to the next thing I want you to get from Christmas. And that's peace. We need to find some peace in this year with so much that is happening. 
We need some peace. But again, we often want peace to be something that affects us superficially, makes us happy for a moment, but may not dig down to the deepest parts of the problem. Imagine someone getting into a terrible car accident. And in that car accident, uh, they have a leg that's hurt and it's broken, broken badly. They're loaded into the rescue squad. They're taken to the emergency room. The emergency room doctor comes in and is talking with the patient who has a broken leg. And the patient looks at the doctor and says, Doc, if you just give me some morphine so I can get some peace, everything will be fine. Give me a little morphine, give me a shot so that this pain goes away right now and I'll walk out of here in an hour. <laughs> we know that's just foolish. And yet that's the way that we want to approach peace. Lord, would you just take care of the circumstance for a moment? Would you just give me a spiritual Novocaine shot and dull my feelings so that I get a little peace, I get a little rest for a moment. No, what needs to happen is that doctor may look at that patient and say, I'm sorry, um, this is going to hurt, but we're going to have to set that leg. We may have to do surgery on that leg. We may have to put in a plate. We may have to put in some screws, but we're going to take care of the underlying problem so that it heals, and when it is healed, you won't have any pain in that leg any longer. In a spiritual sense, this is exactly what God wants to do at Christmas. The angels announced peace on earth. Well, there were wars and rumors of wars and people whose lives had been turned upside down by a census that caused them to leave their hometown and travel far across their land. But the peace wasn't something that touched the surface as much as it was it healed the underlying problem. Jesus came not just so I'd be happy. Jesus came not just so I would smile today because I don't have any pain. Jesus came to heal the hurt that can't be healed any other way. He came to bring peace to my heart and my soul by buying me back from my curse of sin and death and hell. What are you going to get from Christmas? Hope. I hope. Joy. Peace. Love. Let me ask you a question. We're not face-to-face -face right now, so I'm not really putting you on the spot. Do you love me? <laughs> and some of you are probably thinking, well, I, uh, I don't really know you that well. I know you're that preacher guy at Newbridge. You may be a family member watching this with a church member, and you got your own church. Do you love me? Uh, you can't answer that. Some of you who are watching this are probably thinking, oh yeah, I love you, Pastor Rob and Miss Ann and your family. I love you. Others of you are probably thinking, nah, I don't even like you. It's okay. But if you did say you love me, Would you die for me? Would you die a horrible, gruesome, painful, agonizing death for me? Would you do it knowing that I had put myself in the position I was in needing to be saved because of my ignorance, would you still be willing to die for me? 
How about this? Would you be willing to let your little girl die for me? Would you, Dad, Mom, be willing to let your boy die for me? Look, I love you, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I wouldn't give my children for you on their worst day for you on your best day. I'm just saying, they're my kids. I wouldn't give my grandson for you. It's not that I don't love you, I do love you. But I don't have that kind of love. Yet the very thing that I can't do, God did. And he didn't give his son on his worst day for me on my best day. He gave his son who is perfect and holy and complete for me at my worst. My friend, God loves you. And I hope, I pray, it's my heart's desire that this Christmas you get some hope and joy and peace and love from it. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for your great gift to us. And I pray that what we might get from Christmas would overwhelm all of the things we might get for Christmas. I pray for hope and joy and peace and love to abound in our hearts and homes this Christmas. In Jesus' strong name, I pray. Amen.
shepherds in fields where they lay, in fields where Sometimes the question pops up, why do we take communion at Christmas? I mean, the Lord's Supper was associated with Jesus' death. It was at the end of his life, not his birth. Gospels record that. And when Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Holy Spirit speaking through him, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed to die. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26 here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. But this is Christmas. This, this is about the birth of Christ. This is, this is about the baby. And this is about the joy to the world and gloria. I don't want to think about Jesus dying. I want to think about Jesus being born. Except that we can't really separate the Jesus of the manger from the Jesus of the cross. It's the same Jesus. Same purpose for coming same reason for being. Jesus didn't come just to be born in a manger. Jesus didn't come just so the angels could sing to the shepherds. Jesus didn't come just so that a star could shine in the east to bring magi to worship him in Bethlehem. Jesus came and all those things happened. That was the beginning of the story. And in the middle of the story, which hasn't finished yet, in the middle of the story happens the crucifixion, crucifixion and the death of Christ. 
And of course, the story continues even on to us and through us and to the end of time when he comes again and he takes us home and we spend forever in heaven with him for all eternity. But you see, we celebrate the Lord's Supper at Christmas because Jesus came to save us from our sins because he came to die on a cross to pay the price for me, a price that I couldn't pay for myself. We take communion at Christmas because we need to remember that this child who was born, who's not a real threat to our way of life as a baby and a major, becomes a Jesus as an adult who says that I have to take up my cross if I want to follow him. That if I'm going to follow him, I've got to be willing to die to sin in myself. And so even at Christmas time, we take communion because we want to remember that Christ came so that his body might be broken and his blood might be shed to pay for my sins. Now, our communion is a little different this year. Maybe you're watching this and you've had the opportunity to uh, be here in the weeks in advance of this service. And you've taken some communion cups home so that your family, as you're watching this, you can take communion together. Um, I don't have a loaf of bread. I don't have a cup in front of me. But you know, even this prepackaged communion cup, which I have to peel the plastic off the top to get to the wafer underneath. And then I have to peel the foil off to get to the juice. still a reminder. I mean, that's what this is. It is a physical symbol designed to illustrate a spiritual truth. That on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he held it before his disciples and said, just as I break this bread, my body will be broken to pay for your sins just as this cup holds what looks like could be blood, my blood will be shed for you soon as a payment for your sins. And I don't want you to forget it. That's why we take communion on Christmas Eve. We want to remember Jesus being born, but even more, we want to remember why he was born. He was born so that he would die. His body would be broken. And his blood would be shed for you and me. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that this reminder would bless us. Often we pray that you would bless the bread and the cup, but this bread is just bread and this cup is just juice but I want to pray and ask that you would bless this symbol as it impacts my heart and my home and for those families who are sharing communion together that we would remember the broken body of Christ and the shed blood of Christ given for us all in Jesus' name, amen. If your family is gathered around and you're taking communion with me, as Jesus held the bread before his disciples, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this and remember me.
He also held the cup and said, This is my blood, which is shed for the payment, for the remission of your sins. Do this and remember me. And as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we show Christ's death until he comes again. My friends, may we not forget what Christ has done for us. God bless you.